Today, I'm talking with Professor Todd Surivel. Todd is an expert in the archaeology of prehistoric North America, with a focus on the archaeology of the last ice age. He often employs mathematical, probabilistic, and computer modeling into his work, and he's published dozens of articles on subjects ranging from the initial peopling of the Americas, to ethnographic fieldwork studying nomadic reindeer herders in Mongolia, to the extinction of numerous megafaunal species at the end of the last ice age. This conversation is focused on the overkill hypothesis, the idea that humans might be responsible for the disappearance of mammoths, mastodons, giant ground sloth, and other ice age giants. My name is Sebastian Weatherby, and this is The Tell. So today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite topics in all of Pleistocene archaeology, which is the extinction of a huge list of megafauna at the end of the Pleistocene. So really it's about the question of whether we can place the blame for the extinction of all of these megafauna in our own labs. You take the position that we can, we have enough, we have enough evidence now to convict ourselves. I wanted to start by asking if you'd be willing to to paint a little picture of what that world was like that disappeared at the end of the Pleistocene. Sure. I mean, the first thing to note regarding your introduction to the topic is that certainly there was a major wave of extinctions that happened at the end of the Pleistocene, say around 12,800 years ago, thereabouts, in the Americas. But... And on a global context, of course, there were waves of extinction that occurred at many different times in the Pleistocene and the Holocene. Um, If we're going to talk specifically about North America, at the time humans arrived, or some people would say shortly before that, the ecosystems, at least with respect to the fauna that existed here, very different from what we have today. And uh, the animals, the diversity of large animals that existed on the continent would have reminded you more of what you would have seen in Africa, for example. In North America, we lost dozens of species of large mammals, including things you're very familiar with, like um, extinct forms of elephants, like mammoths and mastodons, but also multiple species of horses Mm -hmm. and camels, giant ground sloths, giant beavers the size of black bears, giant armadillos that some people compare to Volkswagen beetles. Um, And those are some of the... The herbivores, when we talk about the carnivores, the carnivore guild was incredibly diverse mm-hmm. and included things like large cats that are now extinct, extinct lions, American lions. And every continent had this menagerie of like carnivores, lemurs, and Madagascar. Giant giant <laughs> lemurs yeah. in Madagascar. Every yeah. every large landmass yeah. had a, had had its own megafauna. Woolly now, rhinos in Eurasia. Right. Um, Woolly mammoths in Eurasia. Yeah. Um uh, in Australia, yeah, a huge array of, of large extinct marsupials, reptiles, and, and birds. Um, in North America, you know, the the carnivores include cheetahs and saber-toothed cats and giant yeah. short-faced bears, dire wolves. Uh, the, the megafauna were even more diverse in, in South America. And yeah, Australia also experienced a large extinction event. Um, and there are other extinction events on islands, too, lar- large islands like Madagascar that you mentioned. New Zealand was home to at least half a dozen species of large flightless birds called uh, moas. And then all the major island archipelagos suffered waves of extinction, too, although less so involving very large mm-hmm. animals because they just didn't exist on a lot of those islands. But even right. like the Caribbean um, had ground sloths. That, that suffered extinction in the Holocene. So to start with, let's let's zoom in on the Americas because that's where uh, you've done the most work and published the most uh, the most research papers. but then we'll we'll uh, zoom back out to the whole world because it's it's really important, I think, to uh, touch on that point of yours that this isn't just a late Pleistocene event that took place 13, 15,000 years ago depending on who you talk to, it's, it's, it's something that took place at different times in different places. Um, but to start with, you're, you would make the case that human hunting played the primary role in driving a lot of these species to extinction 
And to that, a lot of archaeologists would say, I don't see very many kill sites. And they're right. They're right. And you're right. Yeah, I, I will say first that um, when I was first introduced to the overkill hypothesis, I was very skeptical of it. In fact, I didn't, I didn't buy it at all. Um, and when I was a graduate student at the University of Arizona, I was very fortunate to have met Paul Martin. And Paul Martin didn't develop the overkill hypothesis, but he was by far its greatest champion. Mm-hmm. From the 1960s through the 1990s and early 2000s before he passed. And Paul was very kind to me and um, always welcomed me to his office. He had this incredible office up on Tumamak Hill out in the desert in Arizona with a huge library. And then behind his desk, he had a, a table with a glass top that he was full of dung of Pleistocene animals, including mammoth dung and... Um, Sloth dung, he had this incredible dung collection. Anyway, I'd go up there and talk with Paul about overkill, and you know, I, I just didn't didn't buy it, and I'd tell him why. And the primary reason is the reason that you state, which is, if we're talking about the North American case, if humans caused the extinction of all these animals, they killed millions of them. And yet, not only is the evidence rare, it tends to, the evidence that we do have for human interaction with these species is limited to a very small number. Mm-hmm. We have pretty good evidence that humans hunted mammoths and mastodons and bison antiquus, the Ice Age version of the American bison, and very sparse evidence that humans hunted horses and camels, but very little evidence that people hunted any of the remaining um, extinct megafauna. Mm-hmm. So, right, if you're going to say that humans um, caused this extinction event and killed millions of animals in the process, it's a difficult argument to make convincingly if there's very, very little evidence. Right, because you don't just want to show that, you, you wouldn't want to show just that people occasionally would go after a mammoth, but that this was something that happened pretty frequently, that this was a pretty common sight in Ice Age North America. Right. You can certainly hunt mammoths and elephants at levels that would not yeah. drive them to to extinction. Um, so simply showing that people did alone is, is not enough to, to demonstrate the case for overkill. And if you have no evidence, for example, for hunting of various species of giant ground sloths, well, how are you going to make the argument that people caused their extinction? That was definitely my major point of critique when talking to Paul um, and wh- why, I didn't, why I didn't buy the argument. And I would say a lot of archaeologists still feel that way. Um, and for me, over time, I've come to decide that I was wrong and, and Paul was right. Um, that's not to say that, um, that I'm 100% confident in my new position either. <laughs> um, but having a greater understanding of the archaeological record, what structures it, both in the Americas and beyond, a greater understanding of the extinction process, how it appears in the fossil record, and how it relates to archaeology, ultimately led me to believe that humans were the primary agent of extinction. Mm-hmm. This is not to say that people necessarily drove all of these animals to extinction. I mean. We don't necessarily need a unifying cause for every species that went extinct. Yeah. But I would contend that if humans had never colonized the Americas, the vast majority of those animals would still be walking around here today. So depending on who you talk to, there's between, I don't know, 14 to 16 mammoth kill sites that people can agree on. There's quite a few more that are claimed to be kill sites that uh, there's a lot of debate around. But the number that are agreed upon is, is quite low. So how do, you, how do you actually get at the question of what that number means compared with other places in the world? So that number, first of all, is mostly, you're right, it's mostly mammoth kill sites. But we do have one site, the Kimswick site, that has multiple mastodon 
Gales, and then Findel Mundo and Sonora uh, is actually a kill site of uh, Gomphothere, hmm. which is another species of proboscidean that that's common. Um, proboscidean being the family that includes elephants and mammoth and and mastodons and stegodons species. and yeah. So right, uh, I mean, he, here's the problem with trying to link like how much stuff we find in the archaeological record to the question of whether that's enough to have driven an extinction event. A lot of people will tell you, well, they must have killed, you know, a million mammoths to drive mammoths to extinction, but we only have 14 kill sites, therefore, you know, it's just not enough evidence to to demonstrate that. Well, that's kind of a naive argument because if you think about it, before we started doing any archaeology whatsoever, we had zero mammoth kill sites, right? Is that absence of evidence meaningful? Does it speak to the question whatsoever? Yeah. It doesn't, right? So part of this is a sample size issue. Given you know, the sample of sites that we have dug that date to this very tiny time period where we have overlap of humans and mammoths in the New World, for example, is 14 a large number. Again, it's a very difficult question to answer. Uh, one way we tried to answer this when I say we myself and my colleague Nicole Wagesback was to compare the abundance of proboscidean what we called kill scavenge sites. So a lot of these sites, right, you have a dead animal associated with a scatter of chipped stone. And there's some debate as to whether any these particular animals were killed or scavenged. So we just call them kill scavenge sites. I think the vast majority of them are kill sites. But how does the density of those sites in North America, for example, compare to the density of similar sites from around the world? And while the Clovis record of hunting mammoths is by far the best known, the archaeological record of human interaction with elephants and their relatives goes back 1.8 million years and spans Mm -hmm. five continents. Yeah. It occurs in Africa with some of the earliest sites in the world, Olduan Lower Paleolithic sites, there are multiple lower Paleolithic sites where you have dead elephants with tight scatters of artifacts around them. They occur in the lower, middle, and upper Paleolithic in Eurasia, Europe, Asia, and Asia. Italy has them. Spain has them. The UK, Germany, um, Central Europe, Japan, <laughs> Siberia. Um, and then they occur, of course, in North America, and they also occur in South America. So one, one way we approached the problem was um, what is the spatial density of these things, given how much land area yeah. On, yeah. in each of these continents, for example. And then taking the overlap between humans and these species in terms of time. The spatial density, the temporal density. So yeah. let's say how many sites do we have per 1,000 square kilometers in North America? How many yeah. sites do we have per 1,000 square kilometers in, in Europe, et cetera? The temporal density, how many sites do we have per thousand years in each of these records? And then the spatio-temporal density, which is combining both of those things to say, you know, compared to other parts of the world in the archaeological record, how common is mammoth hunting in the Clovis period? And when you do that, what you find is that it's ridiculously abundant. The Clovis period is off the charts in terms Mm -hmm. of how many sites there are that show human hunting of proboscideans. Um... There's very little that comes even close to that, with the possible exception of the lower Paleolithic of, of Iberia, um, Spain, essentially. So given all those parameters, they're actually overrepresented pretty dramatically. Incredibly overrepresented in the Clovis period. Keep in mind, the Clovis period is spatially extensive, right? I mean, it, mm. it goes from the West Coast to the East Coast and from New England to, you know, into Mexico. It's a big space, but in terms of time... It's an incredibly quick phenomenon. It, you know, some people would say it's 300 to 400 years long. So 14 sites from a 400-year period, from an archaeological perspective, is pretty, um, pretty incredible density. Another way we, we try to quantify it was the relative frequency of proboscideans in sites. So what percentage of sites have elephant bones in them? Yeah. Um, and if you do this, again, <laughs> Clovis is off the charts. It, elephants are the most common, elephants, I should say, mammoths, mastodons, gomphotheres, are the most common species to occur in Clovis faunal assemblages, which is unusual, not only in a global perspective, right? I mean, the, I think it's something like one quarter of Clovis sites that have bone in them have, have um, 
have mammoth or mastodon or gonfathir bone. It may even be higher than that. I don't remember. It might be 40%. But if we consider the fact that in any ecosystem, the largest animals are the rarest. Yeah. For good reason, because they require huge amounts of food that can't exist at high population densities. Here's the, are the rarest animals on the landscape are the most common things to occur yeah. in yeah. faunal assemblages. When you start to view the record in this way, what seems like this very, very sparse record of elephant hunting seems like it's incredibly overrepresented. Yeah. Is that enough hunting of elephants to drive them to extinction? Well, I can't say for sure that that's the case. Um, but if anybody in anywhere in prehistory, if, if for anybody, had a chance of it. yeah, that you can make the absolute strongest argument for the Clovis period. Yeah, yeah. Um, that that's how we tried to to approach that problem, and um, and and I think that that work still holds up today. That what we can say is that hunting of proboscideans was more common in the Clovis period than any other time and place in prehistory, at least given the samples we have today. Yeah. Well, well, okay, so that's great for proboscideans, but if we widen the scope to all the other species that lived in North America during the Pleistocene, with some of them it's hard to even say when they went extinct because there's only a few known specimens, and so you have the question, what are the odds that this is the last one? So how do we get to that question? Was this even a single extinction event? How do we know? So one of the critiques of overkill, which is a very valid critique, is that for some of these taxa that go extinct in the Pleistocene, we can't even demonstrate that they were still on the continent when at the people time got here. at the time people arrived. Yeah, and if that was the case, if they went extinct prior to human arrival, then obviously humans are not guilty of driving them to extinction, at least those, those taxa. <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely fair. Um, but there's this complicated problem of figuring out exactly when a fossil species goes extinct. How do you know you found the last fossil? Right, and it's very likely that you never will find... The last fossil. The last yeah. fossil, right? So the way we try to determine extinction dates is remarkably simple and remarkably... Stupid. I don't mean stupid in a bad way. I just mean it's not it's not complicated, right? You date a bunch of fossils, and the youngest one gives you the extinction date. The, mm-hmm. You assume the youngest one is closest to the extinction date. And I would assume the more specimens that you have to date, the closer you're going to get to that actual extinction date. If you've got 20,000 samples, you're probably way more on the money than if you have two samples. Right. Exactly right. So... Horses, camels, and mammoths are very common in the fossil record. We have dozens and dozens of dates on them. And we're pretty confident we know when they went extinct. But other things like morassinonyx, American cheetah, or tetramerics, the four-horned pronghorn, that are much less common in the fossil record, it's harder to determine the extinction date. And if you take the youngest date we have for all these extinct North American fauna, we can demonstrate pretty convincingly that a little over half of them were definitely here when people arrived. But to say that another way, about half of them, we can't say whether they were or weren't. Mm -hmm. Which raises the really interesting possibility that you you brought up that this was not a synchronous extinction event, a really rapid extinction event that happened after human arrival, but instead it was prolonged over, let's say, 40,000 years or more, yeah. where you know we have one species going extinct at 38,000, another species going extinct at 33,000, another species going extinct at 22,000, and then a bunch of them making it to the time of human arrival. And then if, that, if that's the case, we're probably almost certainly looking at a multi-causal extinction. Yeah, yeah. Um, so how do you tell those two possibilities apart? Again, this is a this is a, a complicated problem. The the real key to understanding whether it's a synchronous ex- event or not is looking at the relationship between sample size, yeah, and the youngest date or the youngest appearance date. If they are synchronous, then the ones with the most samples will be closest to the real extinction, and the ones with fewer samples are going to be a little bit random, and some of them are going to look like they went extinct 
way earlier than they should. Exactly they really right. Can. Exactly right. So the real problematic case for a human-driven extinction event is if you had some species in the fossil record that's super, super common and we have a lot of samples and a lot of dates. Mm-hmm. Let's say we have 200 dates on something and yet we can't find an, uh, an example of an animal that made it to 13,000 years ago. Yeah. Then you could be very, very confident that that species went extinct prior to human arrival. But if those things that we can't establish made it to the time of human arrival are invariably those things that are very, very rare in the fossil record and that we have very few dates on, then you can say, well, this is the fossil record actually looks consistent with a synchronous extinction Mm -hmm. that occurred after human arrival. Tyler Faith, my, my colleague in this project, compiled this big database, and I helped him with the the uh, st- the stats on it, and what we found is that the fossil record is entirely consistent with a synchronous extinction event after human arrival. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I mean, just think about what that means. Let's say we have thirty five extinct genera, forty some species of animals existing on the continent after human arrival. Their populations all suddenly crash to extinction. Yeah. Whereas before that, and and by the way, these animals have lived. On, on this continent for, you know, a couple million years, at least most of them. Um, no extinction. Humans show up, boom, they're gone. Yeah. And so if not human predation, if not overkill, then climate change, presumably? There, there are a number of proposed explanations. Yeah, the big alternative that most people would lean toward is climate and associated ecological change yeah that sort of disrupting ecosystems and 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 wreaking havoc among animal populations the other two contenders are what we call hyper disease or that humans still cause the extinction event not so much through hunting but Mm -hmm. by bringing in diseases to which these animals had no prior exposure whether the humans are carrying those diseases or they brought them with domestic dogs. This line of thinking about about the secondary effects of human arrival is something I obsess about a lot, actually, with, yeah, with disease being one example, or another one being there's a lot of work done showing how Paleolithic humans altered fire regimes in Australia when they arrived, um, for example, or, or Ripple and Valkenberg have brought up the top-down forcing hypothesis, the idea that there are all of these ripple effects and trophic cascades that come from extirpating even a few species or pressuring them out of certain ranges, competing with carnivores for limited prey animals, that kind of thing. And so, so yeah. W- w- how do you feel about all of those, you know, kind of, well, yeah, you, 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 arguments. you, yeah, you're bringing up the fact that there's actually a huge marketplace of ideas. So, um, we haven't mentioned extraterrestrial impact, the mm-hmm. idea that a comet or asteroid struck the continent dri- driving a massive wave of extinction. The idea of habitat modification, again, humans indirectly causing the extinction, is something that Jared Diamond called Sitzkrieg. Um, uh, the hypothesis you mentioned of taking out sort of keystone species having ecological consequences, I know that is the keystone herbivore hypothesis mm-hmm. developed by Norman Owen Smith, who's a South African, I believe, um, megafauna uh, biologist who noted that the extinction of elephants caused savannas to grow in, having secondary extinction effects on on, on grazers, for example. Mm-hmm. And then there's the multi-causal extinction hypotheses that, you know, it's a combination of climate change and, and human hunting. Or, you know, we could we could go with a super multi-causal explanation, which is human hunting, climate change, <laughs> disease... Habitat modification, yeah. and then we throw a comet on top of it. <laughs> um, and the truth is, right, this is a really busy time in North America because we're coming out of an ice age. Yeah. Atmosphere, atmospheric circulation is changing. Glaciers are melting. Sea levels are rising. Ecosystems are reorganizing. Humans appear on the scene. They're bringing domestic dogs. There's a lot of things happening at this time that makes teasing apart explanations and testing hypotheses very, very complex. I have a sticking point for the the climate side of explanations for the megafaunal extinctions. More more megafauna went extinct this time than in the last interglacial or in the interglacial before that, right? And that's correct, yeah. 
like it's not it's not you know dozens of species on every continent going extinct every time we have an, an interglacial as far as i know that's correct there's no extinction event associated with the previous interglacial right or the so, one before or the one before or the one before or the one before and so that's my hang up why now uh now in the geologic sense <laughs> Uh, I have that hang up too. Um, Climate change as a driver of extinction is convenient in that climate changes. Mm -hmm. It is always changing. For any extinction event, climate is changing. Yes, right. So um, the harder part for the people who propose climate and ecological explanations is actually linking climate to the extinction and exactly how that climate change drove the extinction. Right, because, I mean, that's a problem that gets... That's an, a critique leveled at overkill often, that it's hard to... They, they say, show me the sites with the spear point embedded in the mammoth skull so I can believe this. But you can never find a site that has climate change embedded in a mammoth skull. You, you can't... Is there an equivalent of finding well, there sort material? Of is. There sort of is. So. Uh, um, Vance Haynes, one of my advisors in graduate school, one of my colleagues, one of my mentors, worked at the Murray Springs site. Mm-hmm. Interestingly about the Murray Springs site, you got a dead mammoth with Clovis points associated with it. But that mammoth is sitting on a surface that Vance interprets to represent a drought. Mm-hmm. Um and in fact, you have pit features that Vance interprets to be human dug wells, suggesting a lower water table. Um, there are similar wells that have been found at the Blackwater Draw site in, in New Mexico yeah. and on the Clovis surface, suggesting the water table's gone down, um, suggesting there is some environmental stress, at least in the American Southwest at the time of this extinction event. So what Vance would say is, you know, water tables are dropping, the Southwest is experiencing a drought. Animals are now really forced to congregate around water holes. Their populations are already suffering when people show up mm-hmm. and finish them off. So these conditions at least make them easier for humans to... Yeah, well, out. their populations are already dramatically reduced because yeah. environmental productivity is way down because we're in a drought. And then humans show up with a bunch of, you know, already depressed animal populations and finish them off in situations where it's really easy to find them because they're really tethered to water sources. Yeah, yeah. So, so in that sense, for that very specific part of North America, the American Southwest, I think, you know, it's not an unreasonable argument. Mm-hmm. What I would say to Vance is that when we're talking about the American extinctions, drought is not an explanation that can cover an extinction over right. two continents. It works for the American Southwest extinctions. We can imagine very local environmental conditions that harm animal populations, yeah. but we also know climatologically that when drought occurs in one region, it's usually not occurring across two continents, and other regions usually are wetter at, at, mm-hmm. at times. So again, you need some climatic or ecological explanation or hypothesis that spans massive spaces and that took place at different times on different continents if we're talking about it globally yeah Yeah. but even if we're talking about the north american case right i mean it is it's not like the mississippi river stopped flowing it's not like the forest left eastern north america those places are still plenty wet plenty humid there's plenty of water around in wyoming at the lapel mammoth site you know today we have a perennial stream and the clovis component there um, was buried by flood events, and then you had this incredibly rich um, floodplain soil form over it that's clearly a very, very wet, productive floodplain. Within a within a century or two of the time uh, of the Murray Springs site, so again, it's not a continent wide explanation. The yeah. extinction was. You might have local environmental events in places that can that can wreak havoc on animal populations, but I don't understand how. You could have a climatic mechanism that spans two continents. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you think of things of that magnitude, right? I mean, like the KT extinction event that took out the dinosaur. Yeah. 
yeah, it took a massive impact by a massive yeah. extraterrestrial yeah. body to have caused to cause extinctions on a global scale. And certainly glaciation operates on a global scale. I mean, it has global effects on climate, but not to the detriment of animals across these huge, huge spaces. This is not really, uh, this is not really an argument for or against climate change so much as a thought about um, why it seems like it, it leaps to mind for a lot of people. I, I think archaeologists more and more really like looking to a changing environment to explain whatever it might be, whether it's drought causing the Bronze Age collapse or, you know, uh, 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 volcanic eruption causing, you know, the Athabascan migration. Um, we, we like seeing these, these forcing uh, events from the natural world cause any big change. But it seems to me like the intuition that climate change is a probable cause for this this sort of event comes from watching modern day climate change, which is itself anthropogenic. It's not the same <laughs> as as climate change over the last few million years. Yeah, I mean, beginning with your premise, for sure, climate through time has had massive effects on humans and on the environment. Mm -hmm. There's there's no doubt about that. And, and that climate, there's many, many well-documented cases of, of climate change dramatically impacting, especially complex societies where we yeah. have big aggregations of people who are absolutely dependent on agricultural productivity for their livelihood. And when yeah. that goes away, we can imagine collapse of population, societal collapse, reorganization, etc. cetera. The thing about climate change in animals <clears throat> is that, you know, animals can move. Um, just as, by the way, hunter-gatherers can, which gives you some insulation from, from climate change. Certainly, again, local areas will be impacted, but I just don't, I just don't know of any climatic mechanisms that can drive extinctions on continental scales. I could see a much better argument for climate-driven extinctions on things like small oceanic islands, Mm -hmm. where migration possibilities are limited. Um, and, of course, the classic case of climate-driven extinction today, everybody talk, worries about the polar bears because in a warming climate, polar bears can't go any farther north. They're as far north as they can go. They've got nowhere yeah. to go. Animals that live on mountaintops suffer the same kind of thing. But let's think about, like, let's go back to mammoths and mastodons and just elephants in general. You know, elephants, in terms of the environments in which they can live, they can live pretty much anywhere. Right, they're in the jungle. In, they're in uh, the jungle the in Southeast Republic, Asia Congo. and in Central Africa. They're in jungles. But they're in the desert in Namibia. They're in savannas yeah. in East Africa, right? Right. They yeah. were in temperate forests in Europe and in North America. They were in tropical savannas in South America and tropical forests in South America. Right. They were in deserts in the Great Basin in the American Southwest. They were in grasslands across the steppes of, of Eurasia, the grasslands throughout the plains of North America. They can and do live anywhere, right? So if you want to come up with a climate change to cause them to go extinct everywhere... It has to change everywhere. It has to affect everywhere. It has to affect everywhere. Yeah. And if we're looking for something that changed on a continental scale or on the scale of two continents around 13,000 years ago in North America, well, climates were changing, but not that severely. The one yeah. really new thing is a really clever two-legged hunting primate <laughs> uh, that has spears that can take down really big yeah. animals and an appetite for killing big things and good reasons to. That, to me, is the most obvious explanation at a, at a continental scale. The other thing that makes me lean towards the anthrop anthropogenic side of the debate, um, overkill or overkill plus with, uh, you know, hyper disease or top down forcing or anything else, um, is that I, I, I don't see the climate arguments addressing the whole rest of the world very often. But these megafaunal extinctions took place in Australia, and they took place in Eurasia, but they didn't take place thirteen to 15,000 years ago. Does, does that record line up with, with human migrations out of Africa? Is, it, so, is that something we can get at? 
Right. So when we start talking about the world as a whole, climate change arguments have been made for Australia. Mm -hmm. um, it, the argument has been made that hyper aridity associated with the last glacial maximum 20,000 years ago, for example, was the main driver of extinction in Australia. Right. So in Australia, it was the peak of the Ice Age that did it. According to according to people who, yeah. who who argue that most people say the extinction happened twenty thousand years before the LGM in Australia or even more, um, but that argument has been made. The Australian record yeah. is even more sparse than the North American record and even more poorly dated because yeah. of how long uh, ago it happened. The extinction of mammoths in Eurasia, climate change arguments have been made there too because the extinction of mammoths in the Arctic of Eurasia happened around the same time that it did in North America. When there were dramatic changes happening at high latitudes associated with, with the transition from glacial to interglacial climate, mm -hmm. um, but, um, but let's let's expand our, our our scale a little bit more. Um, straight tusk elephants go extinct in the temperate parts of Europe, probably around forty five thousand years ago. At the time, cave bears, cave lions, and Neanderthals do. Um, there are extinctions on Mediterranean islands that occur with first human migration onto those of pygmy mammoths and pygmy red deer and pygmy hippopotamus. There are extinctions that happen on Pacific islands uh, with waves of human migration into the Pacific, which happened at different times. There are extinction events that happen in the Caribbean with human migration there 6,000 years ago. Madagascar, New Zealand... And in every case, although we still argue about the dating of first human arrival in all these places and yeah. the dating of the extinction of these animals, in my opinion, there is a strong correlation between human arrival and extinctions mm -hmm. everywhere, absolutely everywhere. So when we look at the North American case and we have all this crazy stuff going on with climate and ecological change and humans at the same um, co-occurring contemporaneously – it's harder to make that argument when you zoom out to the scale yeah. of the entire world yeah. and you see that every time humans arrive in a new place, there's this wave of extinctions. And what I like to say about this, Sebastian, is that if you did no archaeology whatsoever and you just did paleontology in any place in the world outside of Africa mm -hmm. and just looked for a major extinction event and you found one, you would know humans had arrived it would correlate with the timing of human arrival. And that's pretty damning evidence. Um, and again, in many of these cases, we have relatively little evidence for direct human interaction with these animals. Mm -hmm. Here's a related, here's a thought related to overkill that I, I really want to hear your reaction to. So a lot of anthropologists seem to me to have, I guess, almost a vitriolic kind of negative response to the idea that prehistoric hunter-gatherers could drive extinctions. And I think it's because people get uncomfortable. They worry that we compare those ancient people too much to modern industrial civilization and that we should not equate those two things. But in the process, it seems to me like hunter-gatherers, both ancient and recent, get transformed into noble savages, into exhibits in a zoo, into... Um, into features of a wilderness rather than intelligent agency filled humans with the ability to shape their environments in significant ways. And, and quite consciously uh, they get, they get turned into just another species on the landscape. Um, I, I think you're right in the sense that people want to see hunting and gathering populations as sort of living in harmony or an equilibrium with their environment and behaving in some way as con conservationists because it's in their self-interest to do so. And I think there's kind of a romanticism about that was, as you, as you stated, that was a time in human existence before we became the warmongering, unequal, slave-owning, environment-destroying, <laughs> yeah. yeah. like, um, wielders of guns, germs, and steel, I guess. It's like we've grown up from the, the Hobbesian view of, yeah. of 
hunter-gatherers as being these primitive, savage people living nasty, brutish lives. But what we graduated to was to Rousseau, where instead they're these sort of idyllic, noble savages living in an Eden kind of a, a, a state. Um, well, regardless of how you want people to be, there is how people really are, yeah. right? Um, if it really bothers you, the idea <laughs> that your ancestors contributed to the extinction of the mammoths, I'm sorry. Um, what's more important is whether they did or they didn't. And I'm not mm -hmm. telling you that they did, mm -hmm. but I'm telling you that you can make a pretty darn good circumstantial case that they did. Yeah. And... Even as rational, rational economic actors, there's good reasons why they would have. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but, but I think you're right that a lot of the resistance to the idea is less about having well studied the facts and the theory of the, of the record and more about how we want to see the world. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think, I think those kinds of considerations have always shaped archaeological interpretations of all phenomena when we look at the past and continue to. And I think I'm as guilty of that as anybody else. Um, and probably you are too. Um, ideally, as scientists, we try to check those passions at the door as best we can, but yeah. obviously we never can do it completely. Yeah. Going forward, do you have any lingering questions related to this topic? Like, are you kind of moving in new directions in terms of your own research? Are there any, any things sure. that you wish you could attack related to overkill uh, that you could sure. get at with more data? Or Yeah, let me give you a couple of thoughts on that. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you the what I consider the greatest weakness of overkill in the American case, and I, I'd like somebody to study it. If we just look at the fossil record of the Pleistocene, megafauna from North America, the most common animals in it are mammoths, horses, camels, bison. Yeah. We have really good records of human hunting of bison and mammoth. We have very little evidence of human hunting of horse and camel. We can't chalk that up to some rarity, like these animals were rare on the landscape. Mm -hmm. These animals um, aren't don't preserve well in the fossil record. We can make those arguments about other species that are rare in the, in the archaeological record. But for horses and camels, there were clearly a lot of them, at least in the mid-continent, in, mm -hmm. in the Great Plains, and the Rocky Mountains, where we have most of our evidence for global subsistence. And yet we have very, very little evidence for hunting of those animals. Um, and that bothers me. To me, that that absence of evidence, I shouldn't say absence of evidence, because we do have evidence for people hunting those animals, that, that sparseness of evidence yeah. Yeah. is problematic for the overkill hypothesis. The other things being not common in the archaeological record, given the structure of the archaeological record today, where it is, what kinds of sites we have, where bone is preserved, those kinds of things, it doesn't bother me, for example, that we don't have evidence of hunting of dire wolf or most species of ground sloths. Mm -hmm. But I sure would like to see more evidence of hunting of horses and camel. And I'm wondering if the absence of that is truly problematic for overkill. Part of the issue is that we've dug a bunch of mammoth kills, right? So the absence of horse bones and camel bones and mammoth kill sites right. isn't terribly interesting or right. important. It's not terribly meaningful. I say that knowing right now that I'm digging a mammoth kill that has a campsite that has megafauna in it. Yeah. yeah. But we have the potential to find camel but and horse. It's quite reasonable to assume that there should be more mammoth relative to some other species given the dead mammoth next door. Yeah. Is that, could there at least be a piece of survey bias in that? Like if, I, if I'm walking along a cut bank and I find a tusk sticking out of it and then I dig a little test pit and I find a spear point. I'm going to immediately call somebody and someone's going to be digging there. Um, is For there... sure, in terms of discovery bias, that's how all these mammoth kills are found, is mm -hmm. a bone sticking out of a bank or a bone in a backhoe trench. And that a horse bone sticking out of a bank, not many people would recognize as anything unusual. Right. What I would say is that the places, if people are hunting horses and camel, mm 
or any of these other large animals that aren't the size of elephants. I wouldn't expect to find so much kill sites. I mean, they should exist, and we have at Wally's Beach a dead horse with artifacts and a dead camel with artifacts, and at Murray Springs, the horse kill area. But where they should occur more commonly is in campsite settings where Mm -hmm. people are central place foraging. They're living in a camp. They're going out and foraging, killing things, and then they're bringing choice parts back. Right. Whereas you can't do that with a mammoth. Right. You You pick up your camp and move to the mammoth because you don't want to carry a mammoth around. (laughs) Right. So, So in that sense, where I would expect to see all this evidence of hunting of horse and camel, or most of it anyways, in campsites. Here's the sad part. From the Clovis period and in, in the part of the continent where we have really well-preserved bone, we have about two campsites. So the absence of these animals from two campsites, is that meaningful? Well, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. So we're back to this question of, you know, how is the nature of the archaeological record structuring our impression of it yeah. and our interpretation of presence or absence of things? Yeah. Which, you know, these kinds of challenges I absolutely love thinking about and trying to solve them. Honestly, I think this particular problem may just come down to finding some damn Clovis campsites with well-preserved bone. I'm digging one right now. I'd love to find some horse and camel in it. We'll see if we do. But I'd love to see 20 of them. And really, because then then we'd get a much better sense of what Clovis subsistence really looked like when they weren't killing elephants. Right. And I think we don't have a really good understanding of that. And I would really like to see some of these other taxa show up in those sites. The other question that I commonly get when I talk about overkill is, can you explain the extinction, or I'm sorry, can you explain the survival of X? X might be bison yeah. in North yeah. America. It might be moose in North yeah. America. Anything it might be that did not die. It might be elephants and rhinos and all these big animals that still exist in Africa where people yeah. have been hunting them for you know a million years or more. Why do elephants survive in Asia? You know, those those kinds of questions. Um, and that is a problem I continue to have great interest in working on. And and um, hopefully hopefully I can get back to that sometime sometime in the future. To me, there's a single unifying explanation, though. And that is that large animals survive in places where people cannot or did not reach sufficient population densities to drive them to extinction. So, for example, if you had a large species that lived in very alpine settings where there tend to be lower population densities, that might be kind of a refugia where they could keep persisting. Right. I would say in every one of those cases I mentioned, they're living in refugia for one reason or another. Yeah. Sometimes it's because they live in places where it's really hard for people to live. Um, uh Arctic environments, right? In the Arctic of North right. America, we have plenty of caribou and muskox that survive and thrive. Those are places where humans have a really, really hard time reaching high population density, Yeah. even today. Um, the reason why is your subsistence options are few, right? You can drive big animals to extinction as a human because we're, we're such clever omnivores, right? If I drive mammoths to extinction, who cares? Now I can hunt bison. If I drive bison to extinction, who cares? Now I can hunt pronghorn and deer and elk. If I drive those to extinction, who cares? I can grow crops. Right. Who cares? I can use I can gather wild foods and use small game, right? But think about think about living uh in Arctic tundra above tree line, right? You drive all the caribou to extinction, what do you switch to? Arctic hares and Arctic foxes? It's not going to work. Yeah. You don't have any switching options, right? And what it forces you into is the situation, the classic predator-prey cycle. If you knock down the caribou and musk oxen population, your population follows them down. Right. <laughs> then the prey comes back up and you come back up and you end up cycling, right? Yeah. In the classic like predator oscillations. Predator-prey yeah. cycle. Right. Um, so when you have no other switching options, these animals can can coexist as predators coexist with their prey, right? It's why, in general, predators don't drive their prey to extinction. But when you have the option of switching to something else, it's game over. Prey can be completely wiped out. Yeah. Um, if we think about the Great Plains, the United States, where we had massive bison herds survive to the present, right? Did people have legitimate switching options? 
to support enough people such that they could reach sufficient population densities to drive bison to extinction? The answer is, I don't know. What's very clear, once we brought the railroad across and we started provisioning towns and we had all these extra foodstuffs coming yeah. to the Great Plains, we almost drove bison to extinction in a very, very rapid amount of time. Yeah, it was only a very conscious intervention that prevented that from taking place. Right. Yeah. Um, um, Sub-Saharan Africa is a challenge, but we're talking about this massive space. I mean, I don't think people realize how, how huge... Africa is the, both the scale of the tropical forest there, the scale of the, the deserts, both the hyper and semi-arid deserts and the savannas. And the fact that we had hunter-gatherers living there, well, they still live there today, very yeah. few of them. But it wasn't until pastoralists moved into those parts of Africa that those animal populations really, really started suffering. And my hunch about sub-Saharan Africa is that um, humans were simply not able to reach sufficient population densities to drive those animals to extinction until relatively recent times um, because of, uh, of geographical you know, factors um, that, that, that relate to all of these places, nothing to do with the people themselves. Yeah. Um, it's accidents of geography, accidents of culture history, for example. Um, so that's, that's what I think is the unifying explanation for the survival of big animals. But the, the bison one is really interesting to me because obviously, you know, here at the University of Wyoming, we have this rich and abundant record of bison hunting that goes, you know, that spans 13,000 years and is continuous in the archaeological record. And this, people are hunting and hunting and hunting and hunting and hunting these animals, and yet they survive. So the survival of bison is a, is a really interesting problem that I think I'd like to, to work on. If people wanted to read more about uh, the ongoing debates about uh, these megafaunal extinctions, who are some authors or some particular particular sites or particular papers that you feel like would be a good starting point for someone? Paul Martin um, wrote a nice popular book about Pleistocene extinctions. Um, Twilight of the Mammoths. Twilight right. of the Mammoths, right. Yeah. I, if, for the overkill side of things, I highly recommend Paul. Paul was absolutely brilliant as an ecologist, as a big thinker. He knew the record, the global record of overkill, and he writes about it brilliantly. Um, if we're talking about you know different events in different places, it's a very, very diverse literature. Um, there's a raging debate in Australia, for example. And for island colonizations, there's much less debate about whether people did it. That's Everybody pretty much agrees. Um, for the alternative viewpoint that people didn't do it, I would say the leading scholars there are David Meltzer and Don Grayson, um, who are absolutely convinced that overkill is wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, although they tend to say that we need to find individualistic explanations for the extinction of, of each taxa. They don't see some kind of unifying ah, okay. explanation. Yeah. For a climatic, for the climatic and ecological case, I really love a paper that Dale Guthrie wrote. I think of it as Plaids and Stripes. It was in the Quaternary Extinctions volume edited by Martin and Klein in, I think, 1989. I love that paper because it's a very explicit model of how climate change could have caused extinction in North America. And you don't see many of those. Yeah. I don't think he's right, but I think it's a really beautiful model that, that he developed. It at least gives people something concrete in terms of expectations that they can then right. compare evidence against. Right. Yeah. In terms of the hyperdisease hypothesis, Ross McPhee is really the champion of that. And he's got a cl yeah. couple of classic papers about hyperdisease as an explanation for extinction. He's also got a book that's just called End of the Megafauna, I think. Does he? Um, yeah. Um, what else? If you want to, uh, you can read my stuff if you um, want to hear the overkill side of things. And I'm, I'm not alone in, in believing in, in overkill. Um, Chris Johnson's book on Australian megafaunal extinctions is really, really good, and I highly recommend it. And all of these sources and any others that we think of after recording this are, of course, going to be available in the show notes on my website, just so everybody knows. Um, but uh, yeah, this seems like a good place to cut it. So thanks for chatting with me, Todd. Appreciate it. <laughs>
Yeah, happy to do it. And thank you for listening to this episode of The Tell. Until next time. Hey, everybody. If you enjoyed the podcast and you want to help me talk to more people in more places, please consider donating. You can do so on my Patreon as a recurring donor, as well as on my website if you'd rather do a one-time donation. The links are patreon.com slash Sebastian Weatherby and www.sebastianweatherby.com. Show notes are also available on my website where you can find citations and comments and other relevant information about the things we talked about today. Thanks again for listening.